Hey everybody, happy Friday. JJ here with ASUS and uh, kicking off another PC DIY show. And uh, we've got a good amount of things to be covering this time around. We're gonna be talking about uh, a couple of new monitors, uh, monitor update for those of you that of course are interested in the ROG Swift uh, PG 279 QM, uh, which I know has been a hotly anticipated monitor. We're going to be talking a little bit about our latest uh, white series of peripherals with the Moonlight white products. We've got some corresponding kind of timelines in terms of availability and some price points. And uh, we're going to go ahead and continue on with the PCDIY Build Builder Spotlight and show off some awesome builds that we've got here from the community. So as always, fantastic to have you guys here uh, joining us for the stream. And uh, we've got a good amount of things to go ahead and get ready to jump into. So uh, first things first, let me go ahead and uh, just uh, double check, make sure that uh, everything's looking good here. And uh, we will get ready to move things along. Hey, John, happy uh, to uh, happy Friday. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying the week. Everything's going good with you. Uh, if you can go ahead and actually confirm for me, audio is good on your side. That would also be appreciated. But uh, with that, um, let's go ahead and get ready to kick things off here and uh, talk a little bit about some good updates. So uh, first things first, guys. As you guys know, if you're part of the PC DIY Facebook group, generally on Fridays, we usually cover UEFI BIOS updates. And uh, we actually had a pretty good chunk of updates released uh, today that I went ahead and posted in the PC DIY group, a little bit over uh, about 100 UEFI releases for both Intel and AMD-based platforms. Um, this continues on uh, for the 1.2.0.3 patch C uh, based Agisa build, if you're following kind of the AMD 400, 500 series of motherboards where we've been releasing UEFI updates. Um, and the large majority of the other updates that we released are essentially just a transitional update, uh, which is an alignment for the upcoming Windows 11 release. Uh, if you're not running Windows 11, don't even worry about uh, downloading uh, this UEFI. And technically, the UEFI that you're running uh, is probably actually already interoperable with Windows 11. It just may require manual settings in terms of certain bootable parameters to be enabled within your UEFI environment. But all the way around, if you're generally somebody that's kind of into updating your UEFI BIOS, you're probably aware of some of these aspects. If not, make sure to join our group. Take a look at the full announcement post that I go ahead and post in the group. It covers a lot of specifics regarding what you want to keep in mind when you're updating your UEFI, as well as the full breakdown for the boards that we have gone ahead and released the UEFI releases for in the essentially about the last uh, seven to 10 days. I will compile essentially all the boards within that last seven to 10 day period and post them. All right, guys. Uh, fantastic. Uh, thanks, Zach, for confirming for me that the audio is coming through OK. So again, guys, we've got uh, UEFI updates for both uh, AMD series motherboards that have been posted. Uh, like I said, these are continuing on with the 1.2.0.3 uh, patch, uh, patch C uh, based release. And uh, we should have the majority, like I said, the boards all patched out probably by uh, about the middle of September, possibly a little bit earlier than that, as uh, the vast majority of them now have already received essentially this patch update. And then, like I said, there's a large number of updates that we've gone ahead and issued for Intel series boards as well. All right, guys, um, I will go ahead and actually, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, let me go ahead and drop the link in there for the group for those of you that are not aware uh, about our PC DIY group, if you guys are interested in checking it out. And you guys can uh, essentially check out the announcements that we post there, so. Very cool. Hey, Kevin, um, there were some B50, B550 boards um, that were posted in there. I don't remember uh, which one specifically. Uh, maybe see if I can jump and check actually the list uh, quickly and see right here which one was in there. Uh, looks like we had the B550-A, the XE, the, XE, um, the Pro, um, and I think Yep, those look, uh, excuse me, yeah, the B550M, um, all those were updated. But like I said, uh, just make sure to keep a, uh, keep it tuned for the corresponding uh, Friday announcements for the corresponding board. Um, your board, I believe, already in question, though, the DEF F has already received an update uh, pretty recently. So it's either on the patch B release, which is already very recent, or it will be slowly, like, excuse me, it will be uh, transitioned very shortly over to the patch C release. So just make sure to go ahead and keep it tuned for those forthcoming announcements. Um, it's not really about that it's a question of one takes longer than another. Um, you know, overall, if you relatively take a look at the relative metric uh, in terms of the time, um, actually, I would say that historically, the B550 uh, range of boards, especially Dash A, Dash F, Dash, Dash E, all those boards actually are usually in the first waves of, of timeline releases. And if I actually check it right now, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to see that this board um, UEFI release is actually very recent. 
Um, so I know that definitely many of us, um, you know, we're, we're always passionate. We want to try to get things as soon as possible, but inherently it just takes time in terms of going through validation um, and qualification process. And we want to make sure to issue the UEFI releases once they have gone ahead and completed that. Um, so uh, let's see right here. Yeah, we, I can see here that the last release uh, was patch B, um, which was a beta release, which was uh, 622, which would already be recent, but then we also supplemented a release on 721, uh, which was for the Windows 11 transition. So your patch C, as I've noted, is going to be in alignment with what our original target was, which was uh, looking to release uh, essentially the, the the final end of the boards, except probably by about the end of this month. So it could be in next week's following release, or like I said, sometime in early um, September. So make sure to go ahead and keep it tuned, man. All right, guys. Um, so next things for, excuse me, next thing, <laughs> next thing up, I want to go ahead and actually talk a little bit about an availability update. And that's going to be, um, for already essentially a wide range of boards that I went ahead and had a previous live stream on. And that's going to be for our lineup of X570 refresh based motherboards. If you guys checked out, um, essentially those boards in previous kind of teaser posts or anything like that, or you're interested, make sure to check out the full live stream. It's right now on YouTube. It's on Facebook, so you can watch it. It's an on-demand stream where we cover all four of the motherboards, technically five, because we have a new Crosshair 8 Extreme. We have a ProArt X570 Creator Board. We have an upcoming Tough Gaming X570 Pro uh, 2 variant. And then we also have an ROG Strix uh, uh, Dashy e Gaming uh, 2 variant that will also be coming up. And then there's, of course, also the Crosshair 8 Dark Hero board. Um, for, for reference, uh, if you guys just want to see, I'll show a couple of pictures here quickly, but the pre-order is already live right now for the Crosshair 8 Extreme. So that's this guy right here. Uh, this is our absolute flagship in terms of um, the X570 based chipset. So if you're looking for pretty much a board that has about everything you could ask for from 10G to Wi-Fi 6C to an ultra high VRM support for 5M.2, Thunderbolt 4, um, extended EATX, a dedicated fan and uh, ARGB controller, an OLED live dash screen, you know, just a huge amount of things. We cover all of this and more in the actual live stream along with some really cool kind of insights in terms of specialized designs and features that we've introduced here for this extreme model. Some pretty cool stuff on this motherboard. It is on pre-order right now at Newegg um, and you'll see the kind of the formal release and availability occur as we move into the very end of the month and moving into September. And this board is priced at $7,999. So uh, this is essentially, if you're looking for the flagship, fantastic choice. But really, for many of you that are also looking just for a fantastic board, you might really be excited actually about the X570 Dashy Gaming 2, because that board is going to be introducing a feature that was exclusive previously to the Crosshair series of boards, Dynamic OC Switcher, and will be priced under uh, the, the price point of the Crosshair 8 Hero. Um, so that will be a pretty exciting board for you guys. Um, in addition to that, we, of course, also have this guy right here. This is the X570 ProArt Creator Board. Um, fantastic board, really focused again towards those kind of prosumers, creators, um, still has a really amazing feature and functionality specification set, right? We've got up to 3M.2, we have 10 gigabit E, Wi-Fi 6C, high performing VRM based design, um, remote management and monitoring options, a lot of really cool stuff on this board as well. And this one you'll see a little bit earlier in about September timeframe, and this one will be coming in at $429.99. Um, no current pre-order yet for this model though, okay? Um, and then lastly, I will just quickly show you the images for reference on the uh, Tough Gaming board and the ROG Strix board. But those will be, like I said, coming a little bit later. And if you want to make sure that you're keeping in tune in terms of when those boards actually get released, just make sure to keep it tuned here to the PC DIY show. And we'll definitely be covering that. And you can also make sure to check out the PC DIY product release calendar that we list in the group, uh, which will actually list products that we've announced but haven't yet necessarily released to the channel in terms of availability. Um, so let me go ahead and bring up some images here. And if there's any questions that have popped up there, I'll definitely make sure and cover those as well. So um, give me one second to just uh, load up an image here for the Tough Gaming board. And we'll also get the uh, X570 board. There we go. Okay, great. So we've got the two here. So this will be the uh, Tough Gaming X570 Pro uh, 2. And this board pretty much will have everything. I think this is going to be a fantastic choice for you that um, kind of just really don't necessarily want to jump up to, um, you know, an ultra high or kind of a uh, high premium based board in terms of more specialized features and functions that you may not necessarily use, whether it's things like dynamic OC switcher, custom water cooling zone, more advanced audio design, or even more, uh, you know, specialized connectivity like 10G or ultra high USB three uh, connection configurations, things along those lines. 
this board is really going to be a great foundational board to get you into X570, the dual PCI Gen 4, if that's something you're interested, internal, of course, USB-C header, strong VRM, efficient and effective thermal dissipation from the VRM heat sinks. Um, you know, you also still get Wi-Fi 6C, the passive chipset, and a lot of the really good stuff that I think a lot of people just want to be able to have in terms of a stable and reliable system. So very, very solid option. And then we're going to also have this guy right here, uh, which will be the ROG Strix X570-E Gaming 2. Um, this one, similar very much to the current Dashi, which is a really strong value board in terms of its feature set. Um, the, really the main benefit being that you get that Wi-Fi 6C and that passive base chipset design. Uh, there's a couple of other improvements too in terms of like the Q-Latch M.2 mechanism and our Asus AI uh, two-way noise canceling technology and a couple other things. But if you wanna, like I said, get the full breakdown, just make sure to check out the full live stream that we had. Um, and that will cover you for all of those X570 series boards. But those two boards will be coming a little bit later um, with probably more formalized updates in terms of their timeline, probably in about mid to late September timeframe. Okay. Hey, Andrew, that's a great question. Um, as far as the active backplate design, we generally do try to make sure that there's what's called mechanical clearance considerations for, uh, for essentially ensuring that the space layout is essentially um, flexible enough so that you can go ahead and have that type of uh, card configuration, especially with the extreme because it is a kind of water cooling focus based board. Um, I would have to verify though um, with our internal team if it's actually passed that type of qualification uh, for mechanical clearance consideration. But seeing as now that the active uh, backplate cards are essentially available um, for our ROG Strix cards, and that is a known variable that we can confirm on. Um, if you want, make sure to either tag me in the group if you're part of the group, or you can send me an email, pcdow at asus.com. I can send that over to our team and we can attempt to see if we can go ahead and confirm that. Um, but I would tentatively say that it should not be um, an issue. Uh, let me see if I just kind of eyeball it right here in terms of the overall layout consideration. Yeah, it definitely, it, it could be tight. I could see definitely what you're saying there in terms of that spacing configuration, but there is going to be a little bit of a difference, of course, because the Z height clearance is going to be um, not the same when you have the active backplate because that, of course, replaces the backplate that's already on, on the graphics card. So, yeah, just uh, shoot me over an email, pcdiy at asus.com. Make sure to uh, define that clearly in the subject line, and we'll see if we can go ahead and confirm for you on that information, okay? Um, just see if there's any other questions there. Uh, yes, I think you can play Minecraft uh, pretty easily on it, on any one of these boards without any issues. Um, you know, although, you know, I'll say, you know, Minecraft can actually have a pretty variable level of kind of demand, right? Because, you know, if you go all the way to like Minecraft with like RTX and there's really big world environments, you can actually definitely be pushing a bit more on the GPU than you would as opposed to something, you know, like Rocket League or Overwatch or kind of other games. So surprisingly, um, Minecraft is an interesting type of game. It's got actually some pretty varied type of load configurations. Um, but that being said, um, that rounds out uh, some availability updates for those X570 series boards, okay? Um, next up, I do also wanna touch on a very important model that I know a lot of people have had interest in um, since you know we announced it uh, way back when, and now we're pretty much getting ready to finally push this model out in terms of availability to the community, and that's going to be the PG2, uh, PG, excuse me, PG279QM. So for those of you who are not familiar, pretty much this monitor, I think for many is gonna be kind of that benchmark sweet spot in terms of a high performance monitor. Um, it's got G-Sync, 1440p, ultra high refresh rate at 240 hertz, fast IPS based display. Um, it really kind of has all of those key features and functions and it even includes things like Nvidia Reflex, um, which is a really, really cool type of technology to allow you to have kind of a full kind of sense of uh, latency and overall responsiveness to your system. And uh, if you're not aware, Asus also has, you know, right now six different mice that are fully compatible with Nvidia Reflex. So we really can provide you kind of a full ecosystem experience if you wanna be able to take advantage of that feature. Um, um, so we have now started to already see our channel partners um, like uh, like the Asus eStore, um, Amazon, Micro Center. They're essentially all starting to get in shipments. Keep in mind that every single kind of channel partner does have their own respective what we call logistics pipeline. Um, so once the product kind of comes out from distribution or comes out from us to them, it can vary from one, um, one partner to another in terms of the time that it takes for a product to be listed. So it can be a little bit difficult to kind of always give you a, an exact date to say, hey, across the board, you're gonna see listings. But uh, really kind of, I'd say starting from today over the next kind of week, you're gonna now start to see listings from more of these partners and it'll continue to improve as we get into the beginning of September. Um, so 
We've actually gotten good deployment uh, in terms of quantity uh, for a wide range of partners. So you can expect to see listings on the Hig, for instance, like Amazon. If you're in Canada, you'll see a listing on uh, Best Buy Canada online. Uh, Micro Center will also have availability. So you will now be seeing this model uh, get online. And of course, as we continue to move into the remainder of Q3 and Q4, you will continue to see availability uh, across all of our different channels. Some people have also noticed that we did list it in the Asus eStore. Um, it is important to note that while we definitely love the Asus eStore and we want to always provide that as an option for you guys to be able to pick up components from us, uh, we do prioritize our quantity and, excuse me, a, a larger quantity and overall inventory for our channel partners. And what that means is that you're going to see a larger set of allocation that we provide essentially to our partners. Take, for instance, like maybe a Micro Center or our Newegg or an Amazon. Um, any one of the partners that we work with in terms of helping to list these products. So in terms of kind of the uh, the quantity, um, you will generally see it kind of more quickly um, um, be delisted from the Asus eStore in general. So just something to kind of be mindful of. But again, I think for many of you that have been hoping uh, when this monitor is finally going to be listed, you are now start going to see it uh, get listed at uh, pretty much uh, channel wide. We're going to be seeing it across a lot of different partners. Okay. Hey, Shadow Fox. Um, we actually are, are aware of Blur Busters. Um, actually, Mark, um, a fantastic individual who I have actually had the opportunity to meet on multiple um, uh, occasions, actually has coordinated and worked with our team. Um, we do actually have quite a number of discussions that we've worked with um, himself in terms of Blur Busters, as well as other individuals and the actual media and community to help to kind of evaluate and look at um, you know, many different kind of attributes. So as of right now, while we aren't formally uh, using their validation program, that doesn't necessarily mean that might not happen in the future. Um, we do pride ourselves, though, and that we do have a very extensive and internal advanced R&D team that um, goes through and validates things from you know, variable O drive to things like our ELMB sync technologies. And we're active actually at looking at things like the community. A, a great example of this is that you know, Blurbusters community was probably one of the first communities that really focused on, um, I think, advocating for things like backlight, uh, backlight strobing, right? And um, even adaptive sync technologies and coordinating that. And that was actually one of the key reasons why we really drove to help to implement ELMB sync, for instance, because there wasn't a monitor on the market that allowed you to have backlight strobing with adaptive sync. So, you know, we work in a lot of different ways in terms of how we coordinate from uh, leveraging information that we get from the community, from media, and from a wide number of sources. Um, and that's going to continue forward because it's at really the core of how we design and develop our products. OK? Um, thanks, Andrew. So good to hear that. All right. Uh, fantastic. So uh, that covers us there. So I think next up, let's talk about some new products. So we've got a, a few new product announcements uh, for this week. Um, and let's go ahead and get ready to jump into them. Oh, hey, Jake. Uh, yeah, uh, PG32UQ. Um, best thing I can always tell you is make sure to check the product release calendar that we have in the uh, PCDIY group. Um, that product calendar, I do update it. It has been updated to actually be pretty accurate for the PG32UQ, which as of right now, we're still estimating probably about earliest in terms of overall channel availability release is not going to be until the end of September. So we're not at the end of September yet. Um, if things change, uh, people in the group are going to be the first to get notices of that. Um, when there's a kind of more formalized availability update notice, um, then, of course, it will be communicated here officially on the PCDIY show, which, again, happens every Friday. Um, so uh, the best thing I can tell you is join our group for consistent updating so you have access and you can check out the product release calendar. Or if you're checking out these streams consistently, they'll help you to know when we actually are pushing out that monitor in terms of channel availability or if there's going to be a relative change in terms of the timeline that that monitor is going to be coming out. But as of right now, we are looking to uh, hopefully release that monitor as we move into the very end of Q3 and move into the beginning of Q4. OK. Um, yeah, so uh, let me send you the link here. Uh, this is uh, our PCDOI group. If you check out the PCDOI group, uh, then you can find the product release calendar that's listed inside there. OK. All right, guys. So next up, uh, like I said, I was talking about let's jump into a couple of new products that we've got right here. And first one is going to be um, just a basic kind of um, I'd say entry uh, monitor, it's going to be a very solid option for those of you that I think are looking to kind of upgrade to maybe replace a monitor that might be a little bit on the older side. Um, but you know, you still want to be able to have something that has a solid set of specifications. And <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> excuse me, um, has, you know, a clean design aesthetic, thin bezels. Um, and this, I think, is definitely going to fit the bill. So this is the VA2. 
excuse, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the VA247HE. So this is uh, essentially about a 24 inch, 23.8 uh, inch technically monitor, supports 75 hertz. In terms of that, you can see that it's got a clean, um, you know, th three point bezel design in terms of three sides are very thin and with the base being just a little bit thicker, uh, but overall still clean in terms of its overall aesthetic. I like that many of our newer monitors, they do have a little bit of just bump up at having a little bit of a higher refresh rate. Again, not necessarily these are gaming monitors, um, but it's nice that you can just get a little bit bump up from that 60 hertz to 75 hertz in terms of that. Um, Good uh, viewing angle performance that you have on this monitor. Uh, of course, as I noted, the adaptive sync support up to uh, 75 hertz is there. You do, of course, have the flexibility if you want to put this on a monitor arm, especially works well. If you are using this for maybe productivity purposes, um, then you can go ahead and pair two of these side by side. And with that thin bezel design, it works well. Uh, your display connections that you've got there, HDMI, VGA, and uh, DVI on this monitor. And this monitor is going to be coming in at a pretty aggressive price point. Uh, if I double check here my notes, give me one second. I think this is going to be sub $140. Yeah, so this monitor is coming in at $139. So uh, very overall uh, low price point, right? Uh, but Full uh, 1080p in terms of the resolution, of course, and then the rest of the kind of key specifications there. And if you're wondering about the panel type, this is a VA-based panel. Um, so you still get some nice contrast, which you can now offer some kind of punchy images. Um, so good kind of just entry-level option if you're looking to be able to kind of have something for a general replacement purpose for kind of email, general productivity, watching some videos online, maybe a secondary system. Maybe you want to just have something attached to, you know, um, a laptop, um, you know, or something along those lines. It's a good choice. Hey, Tomas. Uh, so wait, uh, we got two questions here. Uh, first one is, what is the model name? Uh, so Gilbert, what is the model name for the top X570S motherboard? That one's kind of tricky because technically really a lot of the X570 series motherboards that we have within the lineup are very high performing. And I wouldn't necessarily say that the Crosshair Day 8 Dark Hero is not as high end as let's say the Crosshair 8 Extreme. It really just comes down to the Extreme offers even an additional set of features and functions and specifications that to a certain user could even be more beneficial or they may appreciate or want. Um, an example of this might be is that if you want Thunderbolt 4, the Extreme has Thunderbolt 4. It can support up to five M.2 drives. It has Wi-Fi 6C and 10 gigabit uh, LAN. If you don't have a Wi-Fi 6C router like an AXE 11000 or you don't have you know, an uh, RT89X that has a 10 gigabit switch built into it, you might not actually value those additional specifications. So for most users, I would generally say that our highest end relative general board would be the Crosshair 8 Dark Hero. Um, that is probably kind of the overall benchmark board. And I think for many, um, the vast majority of users, that's probably the most board that they need, right? As far as whether they maybe even want a little bit more, then definitely if you're looking for even a little bit more, then we do have the Crosshair 8 Extreme, which is really kind of a board that is designed for users that kind of want everything. They really kind of want the best of the best. So that's the uh, Crosshair 8 Extreme. And again, I can uh, just pull up an image for you if you're kind of interested in it here, uh, just for reference. So let me see if I, if I do have it here. I should have. I should have it. Uh, I think from just the recent stream that we went through here. Yeah. Um, let me see right here. Sorry, guys. One second. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. Yep. Got it right here. There we go. So this is uh, to your question the quote unquote highest end board that we do offer in the lineup, the Crosshair 8 Extreme, okay? Um, now, next up, I think that we did have another question right here, so give me one second. Uh, is lower uh, hertz better? So I'm assuming that you're referring to when I was talking about kind of the refresh rate for the monitor. Um, no, um, for the vast majority of monitors that people are running, they're generally gonna be at 60 hertz. Um, and so of course you might see monitors that we offer. Um, we actually now offer monitors that are all the way up to 360 hertz. Um, and really the main benefit that you get as you move up in refresh rate is gonna be the responsiveness from the panel and an improvement in motion clarity and kind of the feel of snappiness. Now, generally the people that benefit from this most, I would say are gonna be gamers, but it's not exclusively beneficial to a gamer. If you move from like a 60 hertz monitor to let's say like 144 hertz or like 165 hertz, even in Windows, as you move around kind of the Windows Explorer boxes, 
you kind of minimize applications, open applications, you scroll through websites, you'll notice that things, things that seem much more fluid and responsive throughout kind of the system itself, especially if you're running a kind of fast M.2 based SSD, uh, a PCIe, M excuse me, a PCIe SSD, um, or even a traditional SATA based SSD, it really kind of helps to bridge the responsiveness that the system can afford you. Um, and if you've got a fairly fast CPU that can kind of process really quickly a lot of the applications, having a faster refresh rate on a monitor can benefit. Now, that's not the end or be all. Uh, refresh rate is important, but there's a lot of other aspects in terms of kind of the panel's design, um, the uh, excuse me, the response time, um, the actual processing that goes into things like overdrive and many other elements that affect kind of the overall experience. But generally, yes, as you move up in terms of refresh rate, it generally is going to be appreciable um, as opposed to having a lower refresh rate. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, somebody asking about GPUs. In terms of GPUs, you know, we're actively consistently working with all our channel partners on restocking GPU availability. So as always, you know, the best thing you can do is look to just take advantage of product notification from any corresponding partners. We are actively producing all of our current lines from the ROG Strix to the um, Strix LC series to the Tough Gaming series to the Dual series to the KO series. They're all active in production across AMD and NVIDIA based um, lines. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, before I get into the next thing here on the monitor, so we got another question asking about Armory Crate. Um, yes, we've actually been really consistent about consistently updating the actual Armory Crate experience. I think really any user um, that used the application prior to probably version 2.5, which was some time ago, um, you know, over the last year and a half, we've consistently released multiple what we call milestone releases, which have improved on the overall um, quality of the installer. We have a dedicated uninstaller application to help to kind of mitigate problems if you run into things along those lines, but the overall responsiveness, the consistency application, and the feature set, all of those items have been improved. We generally find historically that users that have the most issues tend to be users that kind of roll over their operating system, have under other underlying OS-related issues, or are running mixed RGB ecosystems. Now, while we do have um, some interoperability support with other RGB uh, software like Corsair IQ and NZXT CAM, the reality is that when you have codependencies of software, you can run into a higher likelihood of having something not work um, together when one of those respective softwares get updated. And it can become kind of a tricky balancing act of figuring out how things work. Even to that regard, though, we took effort to actually enable a new manual update system, which means that the application won't even automatically update anymore. You have to apply the update um, and the reason why that's done is so that it can help to have the user maintain essentially a system that they know works correctly. And then if they decide that they want to update, they're the ones that are initiating the corresponding update. Um, but overall, uh, if you actually join our PCDIY group, I think that you'll find that many users use it on a daily basis with a wide range of accessories. If you watch my streams, I'm generally using always consistently new builds of the application from with keyboards to monitors to mice to our laptops to headphones, headsets, um, you know, so many devices. Uh, you know, we have the broadest RGB ecosystem in the entire industry when you consider that it's on our laptops, das excuse me, laptops, desktops, all our component products. Um, it's a really a large undertaking for us, um, but you know, we're consistently working on it. And if you have feedback, uh, we have a dedicated Armory Create forum, uh, which is monitored by a dev team that you can drop feedback in, okay? All right, um, so let me go ahead and uh, jump into my next product here. So um, actually, did I finish up? I don't know if I finished up there on the the V, uh, excuse me, the V series monitor. So give me one second here. We'll see if we can finish that up there. Um, here we go. OK, um, so that is, yeah, that's going to be, again, uh, the VA um, 247HE coming in $140. And you'll start to see availability for this probably around uh, the kind of probably about the middle of next month's time frame. Um, so just keep it tuned if you're interested in a solid kind of 1080p monitor. And I'll lastly note that some people um, aren't aware that, especially in the lower price band, you might find that there's many monitors that cars can be very competitive on price, but they also might be shortchanging the warranty. Um, all of our monitors pretty much across the board offer a three-year warranty. And some of the monitors you'll find at this price point from other manufacturers is only going to be a one-year warranty. And so I definitely think that even though it's a lower price point monitor, it's valuable to have a little bit longer coverage out of a product like this. 
All right, uh, so next up, I wanna talk about actually a pretty cool and different type of product. Uh, we've talked about a couple of these in the past on some of our streams, and that's actually going to be a projector. Um, so this is gonna be the new ProArt A1 projector. Um, it's a pretty cool mon uh, excuse me, projector. Um, in addition to our actual projector lineup, it's uh, the first Kalman verified. Um, so it's a monitor that's really focused at color fidelity and color accuracy. Uh, 1080p, 3000 lumens. It does support wireless mirroring, which is pretty impressive. Um, I've actually got a cool little uh, video here that we can kind of actually see here in the in the background. Um, let's see, yeah, right here. And so you guys can see just a little bit of information about it. Um, this will be coming out uh, in, later as we move into kind of the end of the key three time frame here. Um, but this is really kind of kind of be and maybe scenarios where you might have a smaller studio environment or maybe you've got an installation you want to be able to show off your work, whether you're working in photography, videography, uh, maybe some form of digital art, um, and you want to be able to showcase that or be able to just experience it in a bigger, uh, you know, bigger screen, right? And that's the great thing, of course, with the projector is that you have a significantly larger surface area that you can cover, but many projectors don't necessarily focus on a high degree of color quality. So you, uh, Talon Dons is out with a high degree of color quality and accuracy, along with a lot of management options to be able to tailor the actual color parameters, uh, which is part of our ProR palette and preset options that we have baked in here, very similar to our high-end ProR series monitors. Um, that mirroring support in the 3000 lumens, and you've got a lot of flexibility with this um, monitor. It's pretty cool. Um, I can show you here some of the overall connections that this monitor, excuse me, that this uh, projector has. Give me one second here. And let me load that up. And in case you are wondering on the price point for this one, uh, price point for this one is actually pretty reasonable. It's gonna be coming in at a little bit over uh, $1,300 in terms of its actual MSRP pricing. So comparatively, that is expensive compared to let's say like an entry level series monitor, but for a high performing color accurate based uh, projector, um, that's actually a very good competitive price point. Um, so as I noted here, uh, you have outstanding, of course, uh, color accuracy out of the box where it has already gone ahead and been validated and calibrated, so you're good to go there. But as always, you know, if you wanna be able to specifically tune and calibrate resident to your environment or account for what's called drift, which means that kind of the settings can drift over time, um, then you can of course jump into the management software. You can jump, in, jump into our specialized presets that are designed specifically for those that wanna be able to fine tune uh, color axes and things along those lines, and you have those options available to you. Um, you can see the very good color gamut performance in the overall coverage uh, for both sRGB and for Rec. 709. 3000 lumens, which is great. It's gonna be really bright. 30,000 hour lifespan in terms of an LED projector is great. You could literally be running this multiple hours a day and you'd be talking, you know, tens of years in terms of the lifespan of this type of product. Um, it's great that it offers this wireless mirroring support. So iOS, Android, and Windows 10 support. So it gives you a lot of flexibility from whether if you're working like on a laptop to a smartphone or a tablet, if you wanna be able to kind of get send out whatever you have there to the projector, that's possible. And then from there, all your actual uh, connections that are on the display right there. And everything that comes included inside the box. All right. So that is going to be the ProArt A1 projector. And next up, uh, we're gonna go ahead and now jump into uh, one other kind of new series of product, which is gonna be the Moonlight. Hey, Zadek, uh, thanks for confirming for me. So it sounds like you're hearing that you might have a little bit of audio if anybody else is on the stream, whether it's on Facebook or on YouTube. If you can go ahead and just let me know in the chat if audio is coming through for you guys okay, that would be appreciated. So just let me know how it's coming for you okay. Uh, everything looks like it's registering on my side without any problems. So yes, Recon, it is It is a live, uh, it is a live stream. Um, so Next up here, uh, I wanna go ahead and touch on our Moonlight series, excuse me, our Moonlight white peripherals. So this is a pretty exciting announcement. I know for a lot of you guys out there, we've been kind of interested in, uh, in that we were gonna be offering some white series peripherals and kind of products to supplement essentially the wide range of white products that we already offer. So you know, we've got white chassis, white graphics card, white power supplies, white coolers, um, but we didn't have any kind of white peripherals. And so now it's exciting because we can go ahead and expand upon this. Hey, Tony. 
Uh, thanks for confirming that audio is coming through for you. Okay, I appreciate that. So uh, as you guys can see right here, this is going to be the Moonlight White, a series of peripherals. Um, so this is a pretty awesome set of uh, pr products that we have that are gonna be coming out. So we there have actually one of our portable monitors and of course one of our laptops, which is a Moonlight White, but those aren't actually part of the peripheral lineup. Um, the peripheral lineup is specifically there. You can see the actual uh, headset, uh, headphone headset, keyboard and mouse. So those are the three items that we're gonna have that are gonna be part of this lineup. So I previously did make a little bit of an announcement uh, for these products and now I've gone ahead and confirmed the MSRP pricing for these guys. And they're gonna be pretty much similar to what we already have for the standard models. So uh, for the ROG Strix Scope NX keyboard, which is a TTL based keyboard, we'll have them in a couple of different switches. Uh, reds and browns will be the first. It'll be coming in at $119. Then the ROG Strix Impact uh, two, which is going to be the mouse, is going to be coming in at $49.99. And then the ROG Strix Go Core, which is going to be the headset, is coming in at $79.99. So all of them very reasonable in terms of the overall price point uh, when we talk about uh, a product um, that I think has a lot of respective features and functions for each one of these. So I want to go ahead and touch on these a little bit more, kind of a little bit more dive into kind of some of the relative design attributes and just kind of talk a little bit about some of the cool things that you're going to have respectively for each of these models. Now, I don't have the white variants. I have essentially uh, our standard variants, which are black. Um, but um, when we talk about the overall kind of feature and functionalities for these uh, products, they're pretty much going to be identical. So you'll see a parity experience there. Okay. Um, so give me one second here and I will uh, get these pictures loaded up and we'll kind of move there. Uh, so let me load this up here first and go first, I think with, what do you guys think? The, the headset? Yeah, I think we'll go with the headset first. Okay. So this is going to be the, uh, Strix Go Core. Um, this is the wireless version. So it's going to be just a little bit different, but fundamentally very similar. So. It is a very lightweight um, headphone. You can see right there already one of the things that I showed is that it does have a nice foldable base design. So it gives you a lot of flexibility that if you want to be able to put it inside of a bag or something along those lines, it works really well. You can, of course, fold it um, and you can uh, essentially swivel. You can rotate the ear cup so that if you did want to kind of lay it down like this, you can do that, which is also nice. The microphone uh, is going to be fully detachable. So if you just want to have kind of a more traditional headphone, then it works in that regard. It does have uh, on-ear, essentially, controls. So if you want to be able to make some adjustments there, you're good to go. And it's very comfortable in terms of the protein leather that's used uh, for the actual top of the headband and for the actual ear cups. Um, this is what you would call an over-ear. Um, I'd say it's a very compact over-ear. It's not considered an on-ear based headphone, so it will cover your ears. Um, I can go ahead and put it on. So if you guys want to see kind of what it looks like. There you guys go. Okay. So that is the ROG Strix Go Core. And um, I'll, I can do a little bit of a, a up close shot and kind of show you as a couple of things here quickly. So here you can see it with the actual microphone uh, attached to it, but you can detach it. It complements, of course, a lot of our other products, right, uh, which works well. Um, there you can see the on-cup controls, right? So if you want to be able to go ahead and do volume adjustment or mute, then you can do that. You can see 252 grams, which is quite lightweight. So that makes it very comfortable, especially if you're going to wear it for kind of extended sessions. If you're literally kind of going to be playing or you're going to be listening, you know, for a few hours. Um, definitely uh, in this kind of category, when you talk about that type of weight, it is a very enjoyable experience. It's just a little bit of a more generalized shot. You can see where it's got a nice little bit of kind of a dual tone texture where you've got the white, but you've also got the gray uh, to it as well. Hey, Sneff, I just realized I just saw you there. Thank you. Thank you for uh, joining the stream, Sneff. And uh, Elmer, in terms of your question, do we have any plans right now to produce any RAM? As of right now, no. Uh, we're just going to continue coordinating, working with so many of the partners that we have from, you know, Crucial to Team Group to G-Skill to Corsair to, you know, Patriot. 
Um, Kingston, uh, we have many, many, many partners that we do uh, validation interoperability with as well as close collaborative designs. Um, but as of right now, ASUS doesn't have any plans to manufacture memory in itself. And there you can also see that nice kind of little ROG styling there that's on the actual ear cup design right there. So overall, a very clean, nice design that you've got on this model. And right there is where you can actually see that where the microphone attaches. So again, if I kind of do that for you guys, you can see right here, I've got this. I can take the mic, just uh, put it in there. And it does have a nice kind of snug fit and it is an angular adjustment option. So you can see, I can kind of adjust it. So I can bring it up closer, especially with the type of boom mic, you do want a good level of directionality where it aligns right up kind of with your mouth, right? So that you can go ahead and get good directionality, good clear focus from the actual um, microphone. And then like I said, when you don't need it, you can just remove it and then you've just got your standard uh, headphone. Now this again, this is the wireless model. So again, if you wanted to step up from let's say a, a corded model, we do have wireless models, but uh, the white edition or the Moonlight white model is only offered uh, in a wired version, not in a wireless version. Okay, so that is going to be the ROG Strix Go Core Moonlight white edition. And again, uh, that one is going to be coming in at $79.99. Okay, guys, very cool. All right, uh, and again, if you guys have any questions on that, feel free and let me know. Hey, Ren. Yeah, so I actually I did do an up. I did do provide an update on the PG two seven nine QM. Um, essentially, in short, um, I noted that you're going to begin to start seeing channel availability occurring um, pretty much. Um, right now, um, over the next few days, and as we move into next week, uh, from different channel partners as they begin to list the actual monitor. Um, because when we do release it to different channel partners, there's going to just be varying uh, kind of pipelines and logistic pipelines that they have. So not everybody's going to have it listed all at the same time, but you will begin to start seeing listings um, from, you know, Amazon, Best Buy Canada, Micro Center, you know, different uh, partners that are, of course, going to be carrying this monitor. And this will continue to improve uh, as we move into the end of Q3. And of course, as we move into Q4, um, is, it is a hotly anticipated monitor. So we definitely know that, um, you know, it might be a hot selling product, but there is a, a pretty decent amount of inventory that is being pushed out right now. But of course, if it does does initially sell out, we are already working on second wave allocation. And it will be, of course, a quicker process once those monitors are received because the corresponding channel partners have already essentially listed the system. So it's just a question of then processing um, uh, the updated shipments and getting them those the getting those products relisted. But as always, that uh, entirety of that process can be a little bit variable between uh, between partners. But you will begin to start seeing listings uh, from partners pretty much starting uh, you know today and moving forward. Okay. Uh, so hopefully that covers your question, Ren. Uh, if you've got any other uh, specifics that you're wondering about for the PG279QM, let me know, and I'll do my best to go ahead and touch on that when I can, okay? Um, so next up, and the Moonlight White Peripherals is going to be the ROG Strix Impact um, 2 uh, wireless, excuse me, uh, wired mouse. Again, I've got the Impact 2, uh, the wireless version, but of course this can be wired or wired. But I'll use this to kind of just show you some of the cool kind of design elements from it a little bit more closely. Um, but let's go ahead and pull this guy up here and we will kind of take a little bit of a closer look at it here. Um, this is definitely one of my favorite mice. It's a, you know, it's a nice kind of compact mouse. It's got a really nice clean design aesthetic to it and um, you know, works well, I think for a lot of individuals. Um, you know, if you've probably got a little bit of a larger hand, it might not be as ideal, um, although it depends if you, you know, even for me, I'm six foot two, over 200 pounds. Um, I can definitely grip this and utilize it. Um, you know, my hand is still going to give you pretty decent kind of palm coverage over here, but it would also favor, I think, a little bit of those that kind of use a little bit, maybe more of a claw uh, type style. But you can see it's got a very nice, clean um, design aesthetic. Hey, Watcho, thanks for joining us here. Um, Hey, Zach, as far as the Crosshair 8 Extreme, I don't believe right now that there will be probably a pre-order for Amazon. I think the uh, pre-order is just exclusive for Newegg. Um, so probably when you see it uh, listed on Amazon, it will be for an actual listing for the product for purchase, okay? 
Um, so here you can see the overall design aesthetic. It's got a nice kind of symmetrical design aesthetic. 6,200 DPI, uh, 220 inches per uh, second there in terms of the max speed. Uh, overall, very good performance. Um, this is kind of a cool thing that sometimes people don't realize, but uh, a lot of our RG mice have what we call this pivoted button mechanism, which essentially what it's showing you is that internally, we actually have designed the mouse that the actual mechanism that makes contact with the top of the plunger, the top of the actual mouse switch itself, makes direct contact. And some other mice, there's actually a space, there's a gap. So you literally have to press further and with a little bit more consistency to try to attempt to hit the plunger. And this can actually cause a little bit more latency and a little bit more of an inconsistency with the execution of when your finger is actually depressing this button and then actually making contact with the plunger. So we have this zero gap design, which along with specialized tuning that we put into um, essentially the uh, the firmware and the overall PCB design and everything, which is part of what's called a debounce delay, uh, where you actually have a kind of a mechanical signal from when the moment that that is pressed, helps to have really good overall click latency performance. So it's a nice feature that even in an entry level mouse, um, normally, you would have seen this previously in a much higher end mouse like our Gladius 3 or Kiris or Chakram or Pugio 2, which are literally, you know, maybe double the cost. Um, but even in a more entry mouse like this, you're still getting really good quality construction and advanced kind of performance oriented features with this zero, um, excuse me, zero gap or pivoted button mechanism. Okay. Um, so you can see right here, it pairs up really nicely with the rest of the products that we have there. Um, the cable right here is going to be a nice. Uh, cable. This is a TPE uh, lightweight cable. It's not as ultra lightweight as what we have um, on our higher end mice, which is the RG Paracord, but it's still lightweight. And what I will also say is that it does have um, a very minimal, uh, essentially, um, friction, um, uh, very minimal friction, which is important because when you're kind of moving the mouse around on a surface, you don't essentially want there to be drag. And so this TPE material really has a nice kind of smoothness to tracking over a surface or from like a mouse pad or from like a desk mat or things along those lines. So the TPE material holds up really well in that regard. And it's also pretty resilient to like bending and certain characteristics like that. So um, it's a nice solid cable there. And this is also another cool feature right here, which is gonna be the push fit socket design. So the really cool thing right here is that literally you can go ahead and take the mouse apart um, and you can go ahead and customize the switches. Um, let me see if I can do this for you guys quickly. I mean, some of you, of course, on the stream have probably already seen this many times that we've shown off with other mice, but it is a very simple process. Um, so historically, when you talk about a mouse, one of the most common points of failure or a point that kind of a user would want to customize in terms of over time is probably going to be the switches on a mouse. Um, let's see if I have, yeah. Um, and so normally to be able to kind of customize your switches, what you would have to do is you'd have to have a soldering iron and you would actually have to uh, remove the mouse switches through the use of a soldering iron, which could damage the actual switch itself. So that in itself can be a little bit of a risky proposition. Um, but with our mouse design, there is no soldering that's required. You can essentially just, you know, uh, use a screwdriver and you can go ahead and have access to the internal part. So what you saw right there were these little rubber grommets. Um, let me actually see if I can get you a close up right here, guys. Be pretty straightforward for you. Give me one second here. I'm gonna move my extreme board. Ugh. Ugh. You can do curls with this thing. It's it's a, it's a nice beefy board. All right. Um, so I'm gonna move that right there, and I will show you guys here a little bit closer on camera how this looks right there. Okay, so you guys can see right here, I've gone ahead and removed these little grommets, the little grommets right there on the underside of the mouse, right? And once you remove those, you then just need to essentially remove the screws that are right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and take these out really quick. We got four screws. And on um, some of our uh, mice, it's even actually easier to do this. You might only have two screws to remove. And on some, like the Chakram, you don't even have to remove any screws. There's just magnetic clips in place. And you kind of remove those and you have access to the inner chamber. So you've got those four screws. 
And now we're going to have to remove the body. But you can see right there, I've gone ahead and removed it. And you can see there's your actual switches, right? So that's that little blue part right there. It's called the plunger. And if you wanted to then customize that, you wanted to swap those out, you can change those out. So I've got some right here. There's a lot of different switches that you have available to you. Right here. There you guys go. You could pick any number of these different switches and you could just essentially pull this switch out. It's a, what's called a, a micro switch. So I can pull that switch out. Let's say maybe I want to put this switch here, right? I can put it in there. Uh, hey, Greg. So in terms of your question, so uh, a couple of things, right? How much does it cost? This is $49.99. So it's a pretty reasonable a priced mouse, OK? And then how many buttons does it have? This one, uh, specifically the Impact 2 that I have, right, has one button here, another button here, right? Then you have the scroll wheel, the encoder, and then you have two buttons right here, excuse me, two buttons right here on the side, OK? And there's also a DPI button down here on the bottom. This is the wireless model, so it'll be a little bit different if you were to take it apart. Um, this is specifically for the Moonlight White version, but we do have this impact in a lot of different versions. We have it in the Electro Punk version, which is kind of like this pink and black. We have it in the standard black. We have it in the wireless version. So there's quite a number of um, models that we have. We even have a Gundam edition, which is really cool. But you can see right there that I just went ahead and swapped the switch. So that's it. It's a very kind of straightforward process. Pretty cool, and I think definitely one of the coolest features that even at a mouse that's only you know uh, 50 bucks, you have the ability to customize that. And the cool thing is that when you do swap out those switches, um, you can change up kind of the experience because some switches uh, require a little bit more kind of actuation pressure, or they're a little bit more uh, audible. They're a little bit more clicky. Um, they can be a little bit kind of more smooth. So it kind of just really depends. But overall, really, the value add is you saw I was able to do that within you know a minute or two. It's a very straightforward process. It's not difficult. It's very easy to be able to customize that. And it's an exclusive feature that we have on our ROG series of mice. That's what we call our push fit socket design. So again, guys, um, let me go ahead and just show you here. This is going to be for the Moonlight White model. Um, and this one is going to be coming in for, excuse me, coming in at $49.99. So I will finish just showing you kind of a recap here of some of the images. No, definitely not. Um, it's definitely not a high cost. So there you go, the top, there's the bottom, there's the on uh, DPI. And you can see it's also got some cool little accent lighting right there to it. And again, this model does come in a couple of different configurations. So um, we have it in, like I said, uh, black. We have it in the Electro Punk. We have it in the Moonlight White. So there's a couple of different variants. And then there is the wireless model, which I'm using right here, which even the wireless model is not that expensive. Um, right now, I think on promotion, let me just see if I was to check the price point on the wireless model. I think we might even still have a promo right now on the Asus eStore. This might be the, today the last day um, that the promo is, which I think it, the promo code is ROG10 wireless. Let me just see. I can see it. I can double check, guys, if you're interested in using that promo code. Um, but I think even the wireless model right now is still on the promotion. Yeah, the wireless model is on promo for $69.99. So um, pretty reasonable price point. I will drop this link in chat if you guys are interested. Hey, SMU. Happy to have you here, man. Thanks for joining the stream. So I just dropped the link in chat, guys, there. And I'll go from there. And let me actually check with our team um, to see if that promo code is still active. So give me one sec, guys. And I will check on that right now. Yeah, and guys, the promo code is ROG10 Wireless. If you guys do want to try it out, I'm going to drop it in the chat. Again, though, that would expire today. So um, that is going to be the uh, ROG Strix Impact 2. So the last one that we want to go ahead and talk about is going to be the keyboard. And I know probably for a lot of you guys, this is probably one of the most exciting products because every time we show it off, people love this kind of design um, for the ROG Strix Scope NX. Um, the NX in itself helps you to kind of get that sense of 
that this is a little bit different um, because we're utilizing our ROG NX base switch. So traditionally in the ROG Strix uh, scope lineup, both the TKL and the non-TKL models, we essentially have had Cherry MX switches, which are fantastic. They're proven, they're great quality switches. Of course, you can fully customize them with your own keycaps if you wanna go that route. Our NX switches do have some difference in terms of the design where we think we've taken some feedback from the community to optimize the experience that you have with those switches, but still maintain interoperability with things like keycaps if you wanna be able to have that flexibility. Um, but let's go ahead and show off this guy. So this is going to be the ROG uh, Strict Scope um, NX TKL based keyboard, okay? Um, you can see that it's got a really nice design aesthetic. And I'll show you again here the model that I have, the black model, so you can kind of see where the lighting is and some of the hardware level controls and things like that. Um, you can see it's got that really nice compact form factor. And just like what I've got right here, I have an even smaller, I've got a 65% keyboard, but really the main benefit that you have when you go to a small keyboard like this, a TKL based keyboard is going to be that without that numpad, you don't put as much pressure and strain here on your arm to separate the keyboard from the mouse. So you have a very tight, compact and kind of clean setup. And it also tends to be a little bit more ergonomic. Um, we will have it in a few different switches. So you can see we'll have it in the RG NX in uh, reds and in blue, blues and in browns. The browns will be the first, followed up by the reds, and then blues will be the last that we'll have available. You can see there's a little bit difference in that actuation and in the, uh, excuse me, the actuation force and the total force, but overall they're pretty similar. Um, but these switches are really well done in terms of their overall durability and performance and what we also call the deviation performance. Um, one thing that kind of is a little bit tricky for people to understand is that when you talk about an overall switch design is that uh, for every switch, when you lay it out, there can actually be a level of force deviation between one switch and the next switch. And this is inherent to just production processes. But one of the aspects that are beneficial for the NX switch is that we essentially exceed the industry standard in terms of deviation tolerance. So we essentially allow there to be a more consistent experience between all the switches across the keyboard. Now, if you're probably a little bit, maybe more of a hunter and pecker and not maybe as heavy as a touch typist, you may not necessarily ready appreciate this type of improvement. But over time, what you'll generally find is that there's a better level of consistency across all the keys that you're using, especially in that kind of more centralized home row area, you'll find that the keys feel more consistent and um, uh, essentially just smoother. Um, any updates on the Thor PSU? I'm not sure what you're wondering about for the Thor PSU. If you can go ahead and clarify your question, I'll see if I can go ahead and confirm for you. Okay. Um, and we'll go from, from there. So this is right here, the uh, TKL keyboard. So this is the RG Strix Scope uh, keyboard right here. So this is essentially just the black version, but I just wanted to kind of show you um, what it looks like. And let me go ahead and see if I can light this, get the RGB light up here. There we go. Okay, so it's got, of uh, course, per key RGB LED. So very, very nice, even including the little RGB eye right there. You've got the arrow keys that are right here. And you've got this really nice uh, light bar. So this is going to be on the white model too. So this model, it's going to be identical, you can get it in the black, or you can get it in the white, but all the lighting zones are going to be consistent. So uh, all these keys all have lighting, the RGI has lighting, and then right here, the base also has lighting. Um, it's cool, this cable is detachable. So this is a, a cable that can be removed. So if you're traveling with it, you don't have to worry about damaging the cable. Um, I'll go ahead and put this under my secondary camera right here. So you guys can take a little bit of a closer look at it. Um, but one of the other cool things too, is that this uh, keyboard does have onboard memory. So you can go ahead and control the lighting and store customized profiles on the keyboard. So let me see if I can get it lined up for you guys right there. There we go, okay. All right, you got it lined up right there. And let's uh, minimize this. So there it is. This is the size right here, a nice, compact, clean design, okay? Like I said, you've got that uh, RGB light bar that's there at the base for a little bit nice illumination glow. Um, right there, you can see where I said lighting. So you can actually can just control the, sh the shift right here and you could just things like, you could reduce the, light, the lighting right here, you could increase it, you could change the modes all directly on there. We have a, a stealth button, which will automatically minimize and mute everything that you have running on your desktop. 
hardware level controls right here for all your media functions. These are already remapped as the priority. So if you were to connect your keyboard, you automatically have the ability to adjust the volume. You can mute, you can play and pause, you know, uh, YouTube, you can play and pause, you know, whatsoever running in your Windows um, media player, things along those lines. And then if you wanted to access the function keys, then of course you can toggle over the function. But if you did want to control things in terms of customizing any of these keys, you can remap that all in the Armory Crate software. So it's entirely available to you. Um, the top cover right here, this top cover is an aluminum plating. So it does have that kind of premium metal design aesthetic as well. So this is again, the black variant, but again, it is identical here to the white model, the Moonlight model that I'm talking about here, okay? Um, no, it's actually angled really well. So this lip right here does have a little bit of a lip, but we do actually have a TKL key rest. So if you did want to have a key, uh, excuse me, a keyboard rest for it, then that is entirely available to you, but it is not um, overtly kind of a uh, high. And keep in mind that of course, that you still do have the adjustment options here um, on the back. So if I disconnect it right there, you can see that I disconnected that cable, right? You still have, of course, your uh, feet right here that you can adjust. So if you wanted to angle it, then you can angle it down right there as well. Okay. But overall, it's got a, a nice arc to it right here. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so that is going to be the ROG Strix Scope TKL. Um, and again, we will have this in the Moonlight White model. And the price for that keyboard is going to be coming in at, let me see here, yeah, 119. So 119 is the price point for that model if you guys are interested in picking uh, an ROG Strix Scope uh, TKL. And let me just see if I can go ahead and put a guys a link for you here to that model if you guys are interested. So it's a little bit uh, more uh, $10 difference between the standard, so the black model and the electro punk model, which are the two other ones that we have in this TKL version, are gonna come in at a slightly lower price point. All right, so that almost wraps up everything that we have here. And in a little bit, we're gonna jump into our PC DIY Builder Spotlight, but let me just see if there's any questions right there. Hey, Tomas, I definitely agree. I think it's an awesome looking keyboard, really cool over design. If you guys are interested in white, I know a lot of people have just been waiting for these white uh, peripherals. So I'm pretty excited that we have them. Uh, yeah, so um, John, if you're essentially you need to be able to execute an RMA, the best thing I would recommend is use the My Asus app, or you can of course just go to our, our website, go to the RMA section. There's essentially going to be an online form that you can go ahead and fill out and that will essentially initiate the, the contact path for our service and support team to reach out to you to go through the RMA process. Um, you can confirm with them um, if there is an advanced RMA option that's not always available on all products, um, but an advanced RMA would allow you to essentially file a credit card on file with us and would allow us to send a replacement product if we have it on hand available to you before you actually send out the other component. Um, so just go ahead and do that. Um, the best option though I also find is like I said, if you're in North America is to use the My Asus app, it's even quicker than doing it through email and they can help to facilitate the process in terms of getting you settled when it comes to um, putting your product through the actual RMA process, okay? All right, guys. Uh, hey, um, SK NAR, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. We did already cover the PG279QM earlier in the stream. Uh, you can go ahead and check that a little bit earlier, but essentially long story short, it is right now being actively pushed out in terms of channel availability, and you'll continue to see it showing up to e-tailers over the coming week. And of course, we'll even have broader availability as we move into the remainder of Q3 and definitely get into Q4, okay? Um, as of right now, there's no additional information that I'm going to give you on next-gen power supplies uh, under our Thor series lineup. But as always, make sure to keep it tuned here to the PCDIY show and also make sure to keep it tuned to the PCDIY group, which gets that information as soon as I'm ready to post it and talk about it. So um, that's all that I'm going to say when it comes to that. All right, guys. <laughs> um, all right, so that covers us, I think, on all our new products uh, that we've got here. So recapping, we've got that new uh, VA247HE. 
We've got the Pro Art A1 projector, um, the X570 series refresh boards, and of course the Moonlight series peripherals. But now I want to go ahead and kick off the PC.Y Builder Spotlight. It's my favorite part of the stream. If you guys have any questions, comments, feedback on anything else that we haven't talked about as we're going through the PC.Y Builder Spotlight, feel free to go ahead and drop them in the comment section, and I will do my best to go ahead and follow up um, with those questions as I can. So. Let me go ahead and get uh, the first build up here. And I do want to go ahead and recap one build that we did actually show off already in last week's stream. But because I didn't actually have the submission form on hand, um, I wasn't actually able to go through all the details of this fantastic build from AK Mod. So um, I just essentially wanted to circle back and be able to kind of touch on this first. So um, give me one second, guys, here to uh, bring this up, and we will go from there. All right, fantastic. So uh, got his system loaded up here. Let me go ahead and get the, oh yeah, here we go. So this is uh, AK Mod's uh, system that he went ahead and submitted for the PC DIY Builder Spotlight. For those of you who don't know what the Builder Spotlight is, as essentially if you're part of our PC DIY group, we have a form. You can go ahead and upload pictures of your system. Uh, we'd love to feature them here on the PC DIY live stream, and then we might even then go further and actually uh, highlight them on our social media channels as well. It doesn't have to be a professionally uh, modded system or from um, you know professional builder. It could be your first time build. It could be air cooled. It could be water cooled. It could be old. It could be new. It could be mini ITX. It could be ATX. It doesn't matter. Um, you'll find out all the kind of specific specifics there in terms of what is required um, in the submission form, but just check out the group, check out the announcement page for the PC DIY Builder Spotlight, and um, we'd love to see your guys' builds. All right, guys. So uh, let me go ahead and just see what we got right here. Um, so the name for this system is the Mecha 5000X, which I definitely agree. This has got Mecha 5000X type vibe right to it. I mean, it just looks like an entirely different kind of system. Has a definitely kind of industrialized, kind of sci-fi type vibe, mech type vibe, machinery type system as well, which is really cool. Um, it kind of you can see if you know kind of computer components where things are laid out. You can kind of see the chassis. You can see where things are going in terms of the hard line, um, where it's running in terms of the reservoir, the rad, and the fans. But it's it's still really thematically beautifully done in terms of having a clean, consistent theme that has a really high degree of polish. This portion right here is just astounding to me. It just looks fantastic. Um, three words to describe the build, mecha, sci-fi, and concept. Uh, core hardware that we've got here, this is based off a Maximus 13 Extreme with an 11th gen series processor, an i7, 11700K, um, using 64 gigabytes of Dominator Platinum. He's got Corsair MP600 2TB SSD, uh, HX1200 PSU, IQ500X, um, Corsair series fans, QL120s, Commander Pro, um, and then water cooling. It's all Corsair water cooling across the board with Hydro X series based items. So the XC7 for the water block, um, XG7 uh, for the actual GPU block, um, XD5 pump and reservoir combo, um, XR5 for the radiator, and then the uh, Hydro X fittings. Overall, total cost of the system is about 7,200. It's a pretty, of course, pricey system, but again, this is uh, beautifully done in terms of just the overall, uh, the design, the execution, and the aesthetic that we have right here. Um, he wanted to express the idea of combining mechas with military PCs in the future and kind of see how it came together. Overall time frame is it took 60 days to complete this build, which I think for um, everything that you have here is pretty impressive. Um, definitely, it's humbling to me that it's been somebody that's been building for a really long time to see this caliber of work and the execution, which is fantastic. Um, he was most proud of just the overall kind of the look and the feel at the end of how it all kind of tied together. Uh, but beautifully done. Um, kudos uh, to AK Mod again, one of the best modders in the game, one of the best builders. And I just wanted to make sure to recap his actual submission form. So um, fantastic build, man. Uh, very, very, very cool stuff. So again, uh, we did cover it in the last stream there, but I didn't have his submission form. So I wanted to make sure to shout him out and make sure to get his information covered there. So thank you so much for submitting your system, man. Um, next up, let's go ahead and jump now into new systems. So we're going to go ahead and load up our first system here. That'll give me one second here. And uh, this is actually going to be uh, same one. We had some issues with, uh, I believe, Aline or Alan. Um, I'm not 100% sure, so I apologize on, uh, uh, excuse me, on pronunciation for your name. But 
they did also submit last week, but uh, they submitted in um, a different file format that required me to actually have to go convert all the images. And so it took a little bit of time um, that we weren't actually just able to show off all the images that ideally wanted to show in his system. So um, now that I went ahead and resolved that, I've got his, um, I've got all his images loaded up. So I wanted to go ahead and show off his, uh, his system here. So give me one second here. And we are going to have it loaded up. Great. OK. And got it here. And there we go. All right, guys. So here we can see we've got an ROG Helios uh, chassis. We've got actually an ROG Delta headset that's in there, vertically mounted GPU. I love here that we don't actually have RGB fans in the front. Um, the Helios already has RGB lighting there in the actual tempered glass. And I think it looks really nice when you can see that design, although it can look pretty still cool, even if you do have kind of a backfill of RGB fans. Some, some users do do that with their Helios-based builds. Um, we can see he's got a massive four panel setup, which looks absolutely really cool. To me, I think it's a little bit overboard. Um, for me personal in terms of the use, I, I personally still prefer a standard just kind of two monitor workflow. But for some people, if it works for you and it's got that kind of look and feel that it's 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 something that works in terms of how you're going to lay out, um, you know, your applications and you're going to lay out what you're you having your peripheral view. Fantastic. So um, it unquestionably looks super cool, though. Um, you can see right here kind of the side profile shot. He's got the ROG Horseman, which is one of our characters, which is part of the ROG, uh, what we call world view. So it's a really kind of cool, interesting environment, kind of world and concept, which goes into a lot of our design. So we have actually put out a couple of figures. Um, so Seven has been released and Horseman has been released. So he's actually got the Horseman figure in there. ROG Strix 30 series card, uh, Thor series power supply, looks like a, a Strix LC series cooler in there, the 360 and then an ROG Strix board in there as well um, with a cool kind of lighting aesthetic here. Uh, we have it pulled back a little bit in the lighting with not as much of the RGB, and you can see you've got the, a lot of the gray tones. I think that those look good. I mean, you've got a little bit of kind of that warmer light there that's pulling away from a little bit of the focus, but I actually think it would look pretty clean, pretty cool with just kind of um, this kind of minimal vibe to it as well. And there we can see there a little bit of a pullback shot with some accent lighting. So um, let me go ahead and... Uh, see here if I can bring up his form. Um, so we can make sure to go through all of his details here. So give me one second, guys. Okay. And there we go. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, got it. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> Took me a moment there, guys. And let me see here, submission form. Um, so this is going to be from Aline. Um, Bringing in his system here. Give me one second, guys. Just need to bring in that submission and make sure I go from there. Oh, it looks like we've got some additional submissions. So thank you guys for putting in some more. Uh, well, we're definitely not going to be able to get through all of these uh, this week. But uh, that's the cool thing about the spotlight. Usually we try to cover about maybe, um, you know, at least five to eight systems is usually kind of my goal. So hopefully as we kind of keep moving things forward, we'll do that. So um, now that I've gone ahead and got all the forms back up, we will definitely uh, move that along. So very cool. All right. So uh, next up, we're going to go ahead and take a look at our next system here. So our next build is going to be from, I believe, Alexis is how it's pronounced. So let me go ahead and just load these images up for you guys. And this is kind of a, it's got a cool different vibe to it. Uh, I believe this is in a Tough Gaming GT501. So if you guys aren't familiar with the Tough Gaming GT501, this is a, um, 
larger chassis that we offer under our tough gaming lineup we have the gt501 which is larger which is really well suited to things like large atx builds which can use even water cooling configurations um, as opposed to let's say moving over into um, the gt301 which is really well suited kind of for standard either tower heat sinks or like a 240 millimeter aio that's front mounted or something like that um, so here we can see a general shot of the system uh, it's got some uh, peripherals there, tough gaming peripherals, I believe, on both the keyboard and the mouse in the GT501 right there. Um, and we can even see there, it looks like there's like a tough gaming graphics card. Um, looking over there, you can see one of the kind of the key aspects of the GT501, which it has, um, you know, a honeycomb design in terms of on the side, the left and right of the primary front stainless steel um, panel. Um, that allows for kind of that airflow and a little bit of light bleed, which is kind of cool depending on photos and the lighting. It has actually a pretty cool design aesthetic, which I like. Not that many ch chassis have kind of a similar design aesthetic. He's already got here, I can see actually the updated Tough Gaming LC2 cooler, um, or he customized the actual um, um, pump housing with the Tough Gaming Vector logo right there, but he's got a Tough Gaming graphics card in there as well. And it looks like also like a Tough Gaming board in there. And then it looks like team groups maybe Delta memory, I think, or it might be the Tough Gaming um, uh, RGB dims that we collaborated with Team Group as well. But all the way, it looks like it's a full kind of synergy of Tough Gaming hardware. Oh, yeah, and he's uh, also then got, uh, he's using the vertical mount there for the SSDs, so those RGB SSDs, and we can see that we also have those lit up, which is kind of cool. That's one of the nice ways to kind of be able to show off something inside the GT501 because you can vertically mount the SSDs. Here you can see a little bit of a pullback, more little subdued lighting. And there uh, you can see the front of the system. Uh, I think that's without the front bezel on right there. So very cool. Overall, man, a cool build, Alexis. Uh, thumbs up, man. It's nicely, nicely done. It's got definitely like a, a cool vibe to it. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, get to our next system here. Let me see what we've got here. This is going to be, I think, a pretty wild system. So it's going to be, here we go. Ne Tu Anung, I believe. Uh, apologies if I'm not pronouncing that um, correctly. And this is a, definitely a, a pretty cool system in terms of kind of the components and the look and the feel. So um, there's a lot packed in here. It's actually utilizing a smaller form factor-based configuration. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, a more compact kind of setup here. So RG Strix E490-A uh, with a 10A 500 k I believe, and then RG Strix LC240 RGB. Um, and then an, an O11 Mini um, that we have in here as well. And then it's an ROG Strix... Um, yeah, uh, 280, I believe. Okay. Actually, it looks like a 30 series card in there. Okay. Um, so here we can see we've got the actual cooler, RG Strix LC series cooler. We definitely have the Landly fans that are in there right there, which are nice. Of course, they have the, of course, integrated connectors to be able to simplify cable management and cable mounting, which is, as anybody knows, when you're doing RGB in a system, it can be definitely one of those things that you have to account for. Um, you've got that horizontal profile for that uh, 30 series graphics card with the addressable light bar that really pops right there. That nice little lighting that's also happening there on the board as well. Looks definitely very cool. Nice angled shot right there. It looks really cool in that full kind of rainbow mode aesthetic. And based on the components that he's using, everything that he's in there, this could all be fully controlled through Asus or uh, Sync and through Armory Crate. So you wouldn't have to use any supplemental software. So it is nice to be able to bridge it all together. The cooler, the motherboard, the graphics card, and even the fans would all be able to be synced together because the Lian Li fans can support using their own software or they can also utilize a linkage uh, because they can connect to one of the RGB headers on the motherboard and then be synced through that. And there we can see, of course, that uh, full kind of external shot there with the O11. Overall, very cool build, man. It's got definitely a, a cool vibe to it. It's bright, it's bold, clean, and definitely well executed. But, uh, you know, that's par for the course or from a lot of the builds that I see from you. Um, so overall, very clean, very well done. And actually, I think you have more than one submission here because I think that based on um, your system right here, let me just double check right here. I want to make sure that I'm actually going through your correct submission form. So, so I think you might have submitted actually a white theme to build as well. And so I just want to make sure that I'm covering the correct ones. 
Okay, if I come back to that, then we'll definitely make sure and cover it, but um, we'll make sure and tag you in the group there as well in terms of that call out. So overall, kudos though, man. Very, very cool build. So next up, let's see what we've got here. Um, see Alien, uh, Brandon? Oh yeah, Brandon. Oh, okay, actually, sorry, hold on. Next, actually, who are we gonna have you next? Give me one second, guys. Oh, I think I think this is yeah, I think this is a good one. We haven't uh, looked at one of his recently, but one of my absolute favorite builders in the game, the one, the only, uh, of course, Snef. Uh, he did a fantastic uh, <laughs> Gundam based mod build right here, and unquestionably, um, just you know, the fit, finish, the execution, and the overall feel is just it's it's stunning. Um, so. We're going to go ahead and first start off actually on the opposite side of the perspective, um, which is actually going to be on the rear because you wouldn't even see this. And I just think it's beautifully well done to be able to bridge kind of the overall look and feel and the consistency of taking uh, the chassis that we've got right here with the um, the Helios and then kind of what's been evolved together to really be able to bring this amazing kind of level of execution to an RX themed build. Um, so very, very, very cool. So let's go ahead and take a look right here. You can see, of course, he's vertically mounted the graphics card. It's got the uh, ROG Strix Gundam Z590 series motherboard that's in there. Um, and then, of course, we have some customization down there in the actual visible space where you would normally put, like, the the Thor or the ROG Strix Gundam PSU. But he's got some customization that he took in there further as well. He's got the Gundam 360 AIO cooler that really perfectly complements the overall look and feel of the system. Uh, you got that beautiful, of course, mech. Uh, that's there up in the front uh, for the uh, Helios. Colors are on point to kind of all bring that together and tie it look tie it together in terms of the overall look and feel. I love the secondary screen that's kind of over there in the back, which gives it a little bit just kind of more pop and contrast. And this, of course, is just that polish and that consistency and that cleanness, along with just that little bit of illumination, just to give a little bit of fill. I think is really well done. Overall, it's it's a fantastic build, man. Like always, you really do an amazing job. The fit and finish and just overall execution is top notch. Um, and this is just, again, another kind of masterclass build and really beautifully done. Um, let me just go through here, kind of the base level items. Uh, just want to kind of be able to get through these guys here. Uh, simple, clean, bright colors. Uh, of course, the focus here was on uh, Gundam. Vast majority of the hardware right here was uh, um, essentially Asus White Series components customized or Asus Gundam Series components. So the Gundam Edition chassis, Gundam Edition GPU, Gundam Edition cooler, Gundam Edition motherboard, um, the Memories Corsair Vengeance, a Fire CUDA uh, M.2 SSD, Cable Mod Custom Pros, which have been kind of coordinated in terms of the color theme, and then a white Strix 850 watt power supply um, to, to, that was customized there, of course, with that little bit of kind of that layering on top of that, okay? Um, main thing was, that he was most proud of is that uh, he wanted to be able to add a, a cover to the bottom to hide the GPU and a little bit of a screen, uh, which he did add in. Um, and because the PSU, since it wasn't in the Gundam edition, he wanted to figure out how he could kind of tie the kind of theme in together. And so that's something they added in. And I think that, of course, um, it came through really well. Yeah, fantastic build, man. Kudos. Uh, kudos to you, man. So thank you so much, Sniff. As always, it's, it's we're lucky to be able to consistently work with you. And thank you for being uh, really just a, a fantastic builder. Ooh. So I think staying in the theme of white, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at a really, really nice white build from Ray. I think uh, a lot of you guys, maybe the, this would be like one of the perfect builds to go with the moonlight white peripherals right here. Uh, so this is going to be coming from Ray Roper. All right, guys. Of course, in the perennial favorite at this point in the community, uh, the O11 uh, we got right here uh, and just super clean, uh, really polished. 
Um, you know, and of course, I think with black or white theme builds, they can be really clean, really polished, really well executed. Um, and really where white favors is kind of generally having this kind of openness and of course this brightness where black has a little bit of kind of this pool effect where it can kind of have a really kind of cool dynamic kind of contrast and it can kind of absorb colors where you of course have more reflection that occurs in a wider chassis. So they really kind of allow for different kind of looks and feels when you kind of break them apart. Um, and you decide to kind of go thematically one direction or another. Um, so let's take a look what we've got right here. Uh, we've got a vertically mounted ROG Strix Series graphics card. Um, we have an ROG Strix LC Series cooler, which we can see uh, looks like he's actually replaced the fans uh, from that uh, cooler, but he's got it mounted there uh, towards the back, uh, excuse me, on, on the side in terms of your traditional mounting location. But of course that makes sense relative to where uh, the rest of the hardware is, uh, is set up and configured. Very clean in terms of the cable routing. And looks like pretty much all the same Landly fans are used throughout the entirety of the build right there. ROG Strix Series board, which of course we offer in silver, essentially white, work really well for these type of themed builds. Uh, looks like those are the same original cables that come with the ROG Strix White Series power supplies, which is nice. I like that little bit of the blue accent there that you did with the fill lighting. That's the one disadvantage going with the GPU is that the GPU does have actually lighting that is present in the uh, kind of the inside cavity and it has a little bit of kind of this interior kind of diffused flood lighting. But I love when the car is horizontal because it allows you to have that stronger RGB light aesthetic that comes through from the side profile of the card, but still looks really good either which way. So uh, name for this system is called the Iceberg. Cold to cool and classy. I'm going to give you a thumbs up. I would definitely agree with that. Um, this is a 5900X. Uh, I was correct. ROG Strix uh, 3080 uh, White Edition. ROG Strix B550-A, essentially the white variant. Um, ROG Strix 850 watt power supply. Um, the LC360 White Edition. And then some a Corsair memory, the SL in white. He's also got a uh, uh, one terabyte rocket, uh, M.2 SSD. And then the chassis is going to be the Antec P120 crystal white case. And then the fans, as I noted, the Lan Lee Uni fans. Um, so actually, I was incorrect there in the beginning in terms of the actual chassis. It's again the Antec P120 crystal white case, and then the Lan Lee Uni fans in white. And then uh, link up riser cable PCI 4 version, which is important because sometimes with the PCI 3 version, you can run into interoperability and setup issues. Uh, overall price tag, a little bit over 4000 that he spent. Um, he was most proud of being able to get a white series GPU uh, just because it took him a bit of time. Uh, white theme was overall the, uh, the, uh, the focus in terms of the theme. Uh, he just notes a few hours, so I'm definitely noting uh, that, you know, that can be a little bit on the less side, a little bit on the more side, but definitely the cleanness of the execution. I expect conservatively, at least this would probably have been about maybe three to six hours. Um, it was actually, um, this was pretty awesome. He did this as a prize for the community. That's very, very cool. And his favorite ASUS feature or function is actually our GPU power design and overall kind of PCB topology, which is definitely a hallmark for ROG Strict Series cars. So fantastic build, man. Kudos. Really well done. Um, super fit and finish in terms of the overall polish. Next here, uh, let's see, we've got Alex's build. So let's see what we've got from um, Alex. Oh, actually, uh, sorry, we just actually showed that one off. All right, so we are good to go there. But uh, let me actually go ahead and load up that image since I found his actually submission form after the fact. Uh, I just want to go ahead and make sure that we cover that uh, quickly. So let me find, I think, maybe the best two shots we've got here for his system. And we can just recap that quickly. All right. So his was in that Tough Gaming GT501. And we can kind of see it right there a little bit off access. Um, but uh, name of the build is Ultimate Tough. Um, tough, powerful, and military style. Uh, it was pretty much correct in terms of all the key components that he had inside of the system. Um, Asia Horse Cables is what he's got in there, black and gray. Um, and then also an Antec GPU holder. And yeah, keyboard and mouse was correct. He's got the Tough Gaming M5 and K1, uh, GT501, and then even the Tough Gaming Monitor, uh, VG27AQ. 
uh, in there as well. And he did actually modify the Corsair AIO Elite with the custom Tufts logo, uh, which is what he's running there. A little bit over $3,000 for his build. Military looks, um, overall just kind of looking to have a, a tough gaming style. Uh, anything that he would change out, maybe swap out the memory is what he's looking for. Took him a little bit over an hour to build the system. Um, and he focuses on playing some Call of Duty Warzone, um, some Halo, Doom Eternal. Uh, looking forward for Halo Infinite, I would agree. Um, and his favorite overall feature is Armory Crate and kind of the aura functionality that is present on the system. So overall, man, Alex, cool build, man. Kudos again. Uh, a solid job there on there. And thanks for being part of uh, Tough Gaming, man. So let me go ahead and jump into our next build here. And we've got, I believe, Brandon. All right. So here we go. I think Brandon uh, kind of had a little bit of, of a water-cooled uh, system configuration right here. He's still working on it. still not complete. So it's a work in progress. But hey, it's all good. So we can see no name as of yet. <laughs> uh, three words uh, to describe majestic. Uh, I'm not going to go ahead and put in the other two words because we like to minimize profanity right here. Um, budget so far is about $4,700. He's uh, focusing on an overall clean aesthetic um, and also having good contrast, which I think makes sense between kind of the white and black gives you a natural contrast. Um, he's happiest about how he achieved some of the bends in his system for the water cooling, which definitely that's always one of the trickier parts when you go hard light. Uh, three days approximately if he adds up the collective time. Um, and he uses it for work as well as for streaming Battlefield. You can see him testing things out. And there we can see he's got white fluid in there. He's got some lines. I like that he um, essentially put the lines, so not directly covering kind of a key component like the IO shroud. Sometimes you see some people run um, kind of tubing over certain items. I would have loved to see a little bit maybe more routing there to have a little bit of even further bend to dip underneath the DRAM to show off the DRAM. But, you know, it's pretty common to see bends kind of pass over, excuse me, bends and runs. Uh, pass over your DRAM. I think it works okay. Um, the modification there that we've got with a vertical oriented GPU is pretty interesting. I think the actual contrast would be stronger to keep the card horizontal, have the stronger white aesthetic on the side, and then have a little bit of the black that comes in from the bottom of the board, along with some subtle white accenting that's also present there from the PCH. But overall, it still definitely does have that kind of white and black contrast. Um, this works really well, though. When we step up and we go to the red, the red definitely gives it an entirely different look. And so we go from being that kind of white and black to now red, white, and black, I think definitely elevates the overall feel. And definitely even the tubing run um, and the integration has a really interesting dynamic to it here. So I'm definitely, I think, a bigger fan of this uh, in terms of this configuration. But it looks also like that GPU changed up there, or that might be maybe a mounting bracket that you've got right there. Um, overall favorite aspect in terms of ASUS is just the superior uh, products and build quality, man. So thank you so much, man. Brandon, I think a solid job. I'm looking forward to seeing what it kind of is like in its final finished form. But I think here with this last image, I'm liking the direction. I really like the red and the white. I like the haloing that you have of the red. The only thing is I'd love to maybe see just a little bit more white in that central kind of GPU portion area, but I definitely favor the horizontal mount here than I would the vertical. I think the vertical would be too much white in there because you would have white from the IO shroud to then white to the GPU to then the white to the bottom of the PSU shroud. So I think if you could go white horizontally and then have that fill in that secondary space, that would kind of work out well. You could maybe even do something interesting with a small LED strip in the back underneath the graphics card to maybe do a little bit of a bottom red accent um, that would fill in that space between the bottom of the GPU and the PSU shroud. And that could kind of look kind of maybe interesting to give you kind of some red accenting there to complement the red as well. So uh, overall, cool. Very cool, Brandon. Um, hey, uh, so John, what are you on? And he's using control and PC. Um, hey, uh, so John, um, nothing about the router. Just have the, the RG Rapture right here. Uh, it was just kind of just a little bit of kind of, uh, you know, showing something off there on the set. Um, so nothing specifically that we covered in that regard. So no worries. Right now, we're just talking about the PC DIY Builder Spotlight. So uh, you didn't miss anything outside of the general updates that we provided on some new products. Um, uh, a couple of new monitors, um, a projector, and our Moonlight White Peripherals and an update on uh, the PG279QM, as well as uh, the Moonlight White Peripherals and the X570S uh, motherboards, the passively cooled motherboards. So let's go ahead. And we've got two more builds that we want to be able to show off, guys. We've got one from uh, Shannon P. So let me go ahead and load this up here. 
this is no RGB right here, guys. So this is a pretty, pretty strong visual aesthetic. Minimalistic, no RGB is three words to describe the system. 5900X on a Crosshair 8 Hero, uh, running some pretty nice spec memory, uh, 3800 megahertz at C14. So that's a nice kit of uh, memory right there. Of course, water cooled in terms of the CPU and the GPU. Um, no budget. Most proud of the actual two bends, which I would agree are very, very clean. Very, very nice bends that are on here. Well executed, nice integration into the distro plate. Definitely that becomes a little bit more of the focus than sometimes the hardware, but I will say that I actually respect the focus here to leave the hardline accent that comes across the hero. So you have a little bit of that visual identity that's still present on the motherboard. And then tubes are running out to that distro plate on the right hand side. So you actually get some depth and some contrast, which is cool because you still see some of the board. Um, this is the benefit of not going with a vertical based profile that people use because when you go with a vertical based profile it would literally just kind of be this stop to another stop. And I think actually it doesn't create that great of a depth effect. Um, it can look good, but you really have to be conscious of figuring out how it layers well. Um, so I actually, I prefer this type of design aesthetic and it's pretty bold. It's pretty strong. You can see there's a lot of cooling going on here with the massive rats that we have on the top and the bottom. Um, design theme was minimalism. There's a lot going on there. So I don't know if I would categorize it minimalism. Definitely. Um, you know, I would consider this actually a pretty heavy and complex space, um, system, uh, but it's very cool and it's really clean in terms of the execution. Um, so in that regard, maybe some people may have that perception of a minimalistic type vibe. Um, anything you would change out, uh, maybe actually change out to noise blocker and uh, noise blocker e-loop fans. Um, took them about a week to, excuse me, uh, took, them, took, them about a, took them about a week to complete. Um, mostly used for gaming, uh, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare, Battlefield 1 and Battlefield 5. And favorite feature is USB BIOS flashback. So uh, Shannon, thank you so much uh, for um, sending in your system. Very, very cool system. Overall, you can see there's a lot of time and work and effort been put into this. Very cool build overall. All right, so let's see, we've got two more here. Next up, Gregory, all right. Mm. I got Greg's here. Where's Greg's society? Give me one second here, guys. Oh, I think Greg's was uh, the work in progress here, if I remember correctly. And I think it was actually an IGP. I was using an IGPU based system, if I remember this correctly. So give me one second here, guys. I want to make sure I'm finding this system. Okay, I might actually have to come back to that one. So let me actually come back to that system because I want to make sure I have actually all the information on it correctly. So I'm going to shift over to the next one here. Uh, this is from the Tech Allen. And this is going to be pretty cool, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, <laughs> uh, as I would expect. Uh, always very, very cool systems uh, from here. So. Oh, do I not have that one sorted in there? Oh, that's my fault, guys. <laughs> no worries. So um, I could actually download that one, but let me actually see if I can find the system that I'm looking for. There we go. Okay, we can do this one for sure. Yeah, so this one is going to be, who likes green? Green is always a kind of an interesting choice here when you kind of go about um, kind of design choices. Right. And there we go. Oh, actually, <laughs> that is not uh, 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 that one, I don't actually have the images for that system. So I'm going to go with a different system here. So let me go ahead and go with, let's see here. Sorry guys, one second here.
Okay, there we go. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's go with this is going to be from Sky Lee, I believe is the builder's name. So we've got pretty cool system here. So this is going to be definitely a, a, a lot of work you can see has kind of gone into the system here. Very kind of clean focus uh, in terms of the overall design aesthetic that we've got for this build. So just get all the images loaded up here and we will jump into it. Thank you guys for your guys' patience here. So this is going to be a pretty different looking, I think, system than uh, standard just because we've got like some flow integration and some other things that isn't necessarily as commonly, I think, present and kind of all systems right here. There we go. So let's see here. So this is going to be, as I noted here from Skyly, and this is the Yulti GTR gaming PC, uh, Ultimate PC ROG. Uh, it's going to be featuring the Maximus 13 Hero. It's got a 3090 ROG Strix card, Thor 1200 watt power supply, uh, Corsair Vengeance memory, uh, Corsair Hydro X series uh, cooling components. Uh, we've got some LL series fans, Lighting No Prode, um, multiple M.2 SSDs in here. Um, we've got some Bisky based blocks in there as well, and some other items in there. And it's going to be using cryofuel from EK for all $7,000 budget. It's water cooled. Um, and it's a uh, ROG GTR is going to be the overall thing. Three months it took. And gaming wise, his focus is on Forza, um, CSGO, Hitman 3, and Need for Speed. Um, hey, I'm definitely a fan of that. So very, very cool. So let's see uh, what else this system is going to be bringing to the table. So as we kind of pull out, we can go a little bit broader here and go to a bigger shot of the system and go wide. And I think that's where definitely we're going to be able to see a little bit more of what we've got going on here. Yeah, so um, you can see right here, it's got a really cool overall design aesthetic. And definitely, John, um, no problem. I'll definitely, I can go over some router points if you guys are interested in, in kind of talking about that once I finish the spotlight. So I've just got two builds left here and I can hopefully answer maybe some questions if you're interested there on the networking side, always interested in that. So no worries on that part. Um, but here you can see it's inside of an ROG Helios chassis. It's got kind of like a white blue theme to kind of feel to it, which I think is really cool. Um, I love the actual hardline bends that he's got in here. Um, uh, very clean, very well executed. I love the actual ability to be able to clearly see the ROG eye and the ROG decal that's over in the actual well, not the decal, but the actual lighting section that's also in the upper left-hand zone, which is in the I.O. shroud for the motherboard, um, because you took kind of care to be able to line everything up, and I think in a kind of a, a, an intelligent and a sensible way that sometimes can be a little bit trickier. Not necessarily kind of all builders will do this, because it can be a little bit trickier to figure out how you can bend everything and allow for a good layered layered level of visibility. In some cases, what you end up finding is that kind of people will end up routing something over and it ends up kind of eating the space of another component. And so it doesn't necessarily, I think, look as clean as it could. Um, in terms of the, if you're trying to kind of main, maintain an aesthetic of seeing the underlying components um, within the system. So let me go ahead and just uh, get the rest of those images in here. And we'll put these all together right here. Great. Hey, Giovanni, happy to have you here. And uh, the student, happy to have you here as well. If you guys are just joining us right now, we're just doing our PC DIY Builder Spotlight, which is just a showcase of PC DIY Builder system. This is Sky Lee's system that we're taking out here. I think ROG GTR was uh, the name or the theme here. Uh, we can see we've got some flow monitoring going on here. Yep, definitely flow monitors in there. That wide shot, very, very cool block. Those fittings running out from there. I love the ROGI, and I like the fact that you actually picked a different color for the ROGI, even though the majority of what you've kind of gone with is in that white or that kind of blue theme, because then the red kind of just pops a little bit more to kind of a little bit give it a different uh, feel and a different point of contrast within the system. So that's pretty cool. 
This is what I was talking about, guys. And when you remember, I said earlier on that some users will take RGB fans and put them into Helios, even though the Helios has an RGB pattern at the front. And you can see you use a little bit of that textual difference, but it does add in kind of an overlaid textual difference that's present there. So I still think it actually looks pretty cool where you have the RGB lighting in the back to kind of give it a little bit of lighting, but then you still also have the textured pat, uh, pattern that's also there uh, in the tempered glass. I'd love to hear what you guys think there. And then a side profile shot right here. Uh, looking pretty clean, nicely done. One of the best arrangements, I think, of RGB cables that I've seen right there. Sometimes they can look a little bit kind of uh, messy, a little bit trickier to figure out how you kind of route them cleanly and uh, and kind of bend them nicely. And this is really well done, Scully. This is beautiful. I actually, it's, a, it's really, really nice. And I really like the horizontal setup right here. Um, yeah, and that the cryofuel looks really nice, the Mystic. It just kind of gives it this like, kind of nice little transparency a vibe to the entirety of the system. Overall, very cool, man. Thumbs up and seriously a cool looking build. Uh, hey, Giovanni, if you're wondering about buttons, I'm not 100% sure on how you could actually get those. I mean, it's not normally a product um, that we sell uh, because they come included with the mouse. So if you need to get replacement items, the best thing that you can first and foremost do is reach out to our service and support team. Make sure to put the corresponding serial number and the product number for the product that you're inquiring about as far as um, essentially accessory uh, at replacement for any of those items that come included with it, and then find out if they have those available for you. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Um, so make sure to just reach out through formal service and support and see if they could uh, assist you in that regard, okay? All right, so next up, uh, we've got one last build here and we will wrap things up. And then I think Jonathan, you had some questions on some router side. So I will go ahead and make sure to jump into that. So we are gonna wrap things up with uh, a build from GT Lim, I believe. Very, very cool build right here. And I think this is using uh, the new Ryogen 2 cooler, which I know a lot of people are waiting on. Yeah. So let me go ahead and load this guy up here. Give me a second. There we go. All right. Okay, so this is, yep, yeah, GT Lim. So it's got that ROG classic vibe, red and black vibe, which I absolutely love. Beautiful, clean design aesthetic right there by leveraging the RGB light bar in the bold, bright red. So you're not using the addressable element of it, but this just gives you a focus and a consistency and knowing that when you pick certain focus colors, it can cause your eye to just be a little bit more focused as opposed to trying to fill it with all kinds of colors that are a little more dynamic. And so here you can definitely see that there's a play on contrast. So in bright sections and in dark sections. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely a big fan of that. I really love the look and feel here where we've got that ROG that's in the IO shroud that's visible, that bright RGB, um, bar that's on the 30 series card, and then the dims that are in red, and then of course the fans, which are also an accent there in red as well. So let's see what we got here. Um, name of the build is Dark Hero, Dark, Mysterious, and Hero. Um, in terms of the core components, 5900X, Crosshair, Dark Hero, Ryogen 2. Um, it's an ROG Radeon 6800OC. Um, Antec Cantana memory that we have in there, along with some XPG memory for an M.2 base SSD, and then a 750 watt PSU, uh, and that's all inside of a Corsair 4000D. About $3,200. Uh, theme of the system is a colorful theme, full dark black theme with RG signature red lighting and all the RGB synced. Um, and then overall, yeah, RG theme, red and black, which I 100% agree. Um, he said that he would like to update the sticks, go with four sticks of memory, so four sticks of the katana instead of just two. It took him about an hour and a half to build and does it for gaming. This is for Cyberpunk, Forza, Dota, Apex Legends, CSGO, and his favorite feature is Armory Crate. Yeah, so uh, John, yeah, that, that's uh, this is the new AIO water cooler that we're gonna be launching hopefully next month, so the Ryogen 2. It has a massive uh, three, I think 3.5 inch, uh, display on it. So it's a really, really big display. So it allows you to really kind of show stuff off if you really kind of want to be able to put something there in the center field of view uh, for your system. And then pulled back overall, I think this is a really, really well done build. It's not super complicated, but it has purposed 
kind of aesthetics, right? Where specifically he wants you to kind of see the center. He wants you to see those red accents and then kind of everything else to kind of fade away to black and then have this kind of really cool kind of just red and black vibe to it, which I definitely dig. Very, very cool. And the cool thing is here is because everything is RGB and it can be synced easily, he could totally change this up. He could swap this to white. He could swap it to blue. He could swap it to pink, purple, um, you know, pretty much any color. And all of those zones would automatically just have a different vibe and different feel and be all consistent because, of course, the, uh, the contrast is just black. So it's going to go with every color if you decide to change things up. So overall, very, very cool, man. Cool build, GT. Um, thumbs up, man. And overall, thanks for submitting here for the build. So, um, John, the last thing um, I just want to kind of touch on there is you said you had some questions on the router side. I'm not sure what your questions might be. Specifically, this model right here, this is the AXC 11000. It's the RG Rapture. This is pretty much our flagship router. It's the fastest router you can get, um, you know, without diving into kind of all the specifics and the value points of what you can get by moving into a, like a Wi-Fi 6, much less a Wi-Fi 6C router. The main thing that sometimes people don't necessarily realize when you're going over to a higher performing router like our RT-AX82U or the 86U or something like this, like the AX11000, is tri-band units, of course, have three bands versus two bands. The main benefit there is that you're going to be able to maintain two high-speed bands for devices. Um, for the highest performing uh, Wi-Fi 6-based devices, this can be advantageous. And then that kind of standard Wi-Fi band uh, excuse me, five gigahertz band can be used for kind of traditional either 811AC, um, kind of first gen or second gen based products. Um, the other kind of a benefit too is that eventually if you did go over to two models and you were utilize what we call our AMS technology, which allows you to pair two of these units together to make a mesh network if you needed that coverage, which isn't necessarily a requirement because the reality is a high performance router can easily cover, you know, 2,500, 3,000, 3,500 square feet of coverage. So that's a lot of coverage space. Uh, I have a, almost about a 3,000 square foot home, two story, and even in my front yard um, and in my backyard and throughout the house, I have just one Rapture router that covers the entirety of that house. Um, and so you don't have to have quote unquote mesh to be able to have broad coverage. And you can actually have faster speeds with the traditional router than you can have with the mesh network because with the mesh network, one of the bands has to be dedicated for what's called a backhaul, which means that you're using one of the bands to be able to communicate between the two, um, essentially, nodes uh, or the two routers. Um, that is a benefit of going with a tri-band unit is that essentially you have, can have an ultra high speed band that connects the two routers together. And then you can still have two bands for all your other devices, where within a dual band router, if one of the backhauls are utilized, then you only then have one band left for all your devices. Although that can still be more than enough bandwidth for all your devices, that is a benefit by going over to a tri-band model like what you have here. Uh, the other item that I would note, sometimes people aren't aware of, is that your router, just like, uh, let's say, like a laptop or any type of computing device, has an SOC. It has a processor inside of it. And so newer routers are now starting to feature much more advanced SOCs. Uh, so that's essentially just the chip that's inside there. You can have like dual core, you can have tri-core, you can have quad core based processors. And the fastest units like what you have right here, you can have, you know, quad core processors over 1.8 gigahertz, um, you know, with high speed DDR memory. Now, why would you need such fast processing and high speed memory? It generally is going to be advantageous for the more number of devices that you have that are concurrently working with the router. Um, secondary to that, there's a lot of special functions that sometimes people don't realize that can be baked in the routers. These can be things like quality of service where like you can optimize all the traffic in your network so that if you want to prioritize like streaming versus downloading, um, you know, um, or any type of network centric service, you could do that. And the more devices you have, that can sometimes have a little bit of what's called an overhead penalty. It's, it's essentially just more work for the router to do. Um, you could run a VPN directly on the router so that you don't have to install individual v VPN software like on a specific device. Um, but if you deploy VPN across all your connected devices, that can be a pretty big penalty on the router. So the faster the SOC, the faster the performance it will have. So these are just some of the really cool benefits. Um, I would recommend if you want to find out more, check out actually the um, stream that we did not that long ago on upgrading to Wi-Fi 6 and 2.5 gigabit networking, where we talked a bit about um, some of our Wi-Fi 6 routers and some of the cool design features and functions that those models have. And of course, if you have any follow-up questions, then you can make sure to go ahead and tag me in the PCDIY group. Uh, feel free. And that goes for anybody checking us out here as we're wrapping up this stream on Facebook and YouTube. If you guys can go ahead and drop us you know, a like and a subscribe, 
uh, you know, thumbs up, or if you had any questions or comments relative to any of the products that we talked about, um, or you want to go ahead and submit your system for a featured spot in the PC DIY Builder Spotlight, please feel free to go ahead and do that. And like I said, you guys can find the submission form by checking us out uh, in the PC DIY group. And that uh, link will be in the description uh, as well as a recap. So if you guys want to check us out there, you guys definitely can do that as well. So thank you guys so much. And uh, thanks for checking out the stream. Hopefully everybody um, has a uh, safe and healthy Friday and enjoys their weekend. So with that, guys, take care, take it easy, enjoy the rest of your day, and hopefully you guys have a great weekend.